Chapter Four of Our Little Australian Cousin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Charlotte Day. Our Little Australian Cousin by Mary F. Nixon Roulet. Chapter Four, On the Way to the Run. It was a bright morning when they left Sydney to go to the station, taking the train early in the day, for there was a railway ride of several hours before them, as well as a long drive. Now you are going to see something of Australian life," said Mr. Macdonald. "Life in Sydney or Melbourne is very little different from that in Liverpool or Glasgow. On the big stations, it is much the same as on the country places at home." But my station is typical of Australia. Is it in the bush, Uncle? Asked Fergus. Hear the laddie talking like an old squatter, laughed Mister Macdonald. Yes and no. You see, the Australians who live in the cities consider all the rest of the continent the bush, but to those who live in the grazing and farming districts, the country inland is the bush or the back country. Our run is beautifully situated, just on the edge of the dividing range, and we are lucky enough to have a river running through one side, so that the run is seldom dry. What is the dividing range? Asked Fergus, who was determined to understand everything he heard. If he did not, it was not because he did not ask questions enough about it. The dividing range is the high land which separates the east and the west of the continent, and runs from north to south along the coast. It is sometimes called the Australian Alps, and some of the peaks are seven thousand feet high. The eastern part of Australia runs in a long strip of fertile ground along the coast. West of this are the mountains, and beyond them is a high plateau which slopes down to the plains of Central Australia. This central portion is an almost unknown country. There are no great rivers and little rain. The land is terribly dry and very hot. Many who have gone to explore it have never returned, and no one knows their fate. Perhaps they have died of thirst. Perhaps they have been killed by the blacks. This part of the country is called Never Never Land. Uncle Angus. Asked Fergus, as his uncle paused. When you came to your station, were you a squatter? His uncle's hearty laugh rang out. No, my boy, but I bought my run from a squatter. He answered, "The days of squatters were about over when I came out." What do you know about squatters? I don't know anything," answered Fergus. Only. I have heard the name and thought maybe you would tell us about them. In the old times, before Australia had started in the trade, the wool from the sheep on the runs was very important to her," said Mister Macdonald. Men would come out to the country, and not having very much money, they could perhaps buy a small homestead and stock it, but little more. They would have to have large tracts of land to pasture their sheep. But had not money enough to buy the land, they therefore settled down, and took what they needed without permission, and so were called squatters. The government did not interfere with them, because the wool from their sheep was needed, and because the country was so big, there seemed land enough for every one. In time, the matter was arranged by the government's dividing the back country into grazing districts. Which all the squatters might use by paying a yearly rent. How did the squatters keep their sheep from other people? Fergus inquired. Every flock had its shepherd, who led it wherever food and water were to be found. Was the answer. The life of a shepherd was a lonely one. He had to watch the sheep and lambs and see that the dingoes did not get at them. The shepherd never saw any other people. Except the man who brought his supplies from the station, his dogs were his only friends, and often these shepherd dogs are marvels of intelligence and loyalty. For a time, the squatters prospered, and some of them grew immensely wealthy. 
These were called wool kings, and lived on their stations extravagantly, building houses such as you saw at one wee weech. But sheep raising is not all plain sailing in Australia. Rabbits were brought into the country, and these proved to be a regular plague, destroying the grass, so that the government passed a law that squatters must help to exterminate them, which put them to a great expense. When I came here twenty years ago, I got my station from a squatter who had worked it for years and had made enough to sell out and go to Sydney, where it had always been his ambition to live. I have worked hard and been successful. When you see our station, I think you will want to stay in this country instead of trying to find gold in Never Never Land, he said to his brother in law. Perhaps I shall. But I have no money to buy a station, and I can't be a squatter now, said Mr. Hume. Their way lay through a beautiful, semi tropical country. The train moved through fertile valleys, fine woodland, and green vales, and bridged cool mountain streams. When their stopping place was reached, and they alighted from the train to find a comfortable cart and good horses awaiting them, Fergus exclaimed, it doesn't seem to me that travelling in Australia is very hard work. Wait till you get to the bush, said his uncle, and have to tramp it with your swag upon your back. Make your own supper over a twig fire, stir your tea in a billy with a eucalyptus twig, and roll up in a blanket to sleep, waking up to find a ducite snake taking a nap on your breast. That's real Australia for you. I like your kind better, said Jean with a shudder, but Fergus said boastingly, well, I'm not afraid of the bush. Wait and see, said his father, as they drove through the gate which led into Mr. MacDonald's run. It was a beautiful station, and well suited for the sheep farming from which the owner had made his money. The land lay in a triangle, on two sides of which was a considerable stream, while the main road formed the third boundary. The land was fenced with stout rail fences, while the paddocks were fenced with wire. The house was built of stone, of one story, with a broad veranda running around all four sides, shaded in vines, and looking on a garden in which gorgeous-hued flowers bloomed in brilliant beauty. There was an air of great comfort about the place. Hammocks were slung in the porches, and easy chairs were placed invitingly about. Long windows, clear to the floor, opened into the living rooms, and a wide hallway ran through the middle of the house. On one side was a drawing-room, at the other, dining-room and living-room. The guests caught glimpses of books and music as they were ushered into their cool bedrooms. These opened onto the veranda, and were cool and pleasant, with gay chintz and white hangings. What a delightful visit the children had at the run! It was perhaps pleasanter for them than for the grown folk, for Sandy, Mr. and Mrs. MacDonald's only child, a boy of ten, was a perfect imp of mischief, and he led his two cousins into everything that he could think of. Fergus was not far behind, and Jean trudged after the boys, growing strong and rosy in the Australian sunshine. "'Australia is making the greatest change in Jean,' said her mother to Mrs. MacDonald one day, as they sat upon the veranda. At home she was so shy, she would scarcely look at any one. She seemed delicate, and I was worried for fear that she would never learn to take care of herself in this world. She will grow up into the most self-reliant kind of girl in the bush, said her sister. She is a dear little girl, and I think there is plenty of strength of character under her shy little ways. I wonder what the three of them are doing now said Jean's mother. It has been some time since we heard a shriek of any kind. Oh, what is that? For as she spoke, there came a scream so loud and piercing from the shrubbery that both women sprang to their feet and rushed across the lawn. Midway between the house and the garden they met the three children, both boys holding Jean's hands and helping her to run to the house, while the little girl, her face covered with blood and tears, was trying not to cry. "'Jean's hurt!' cried Sandy. "'So I should judge,' said his mother, 
trying to keep calm, while both boys began to talk at once so that no one could understand a word they said. Mrs. Hume gathered Jean in her arms and carried her quickly to the house, where she washed the little tear-stained face. The child's lip was terribly cut, and she was badly frightened, but not seriously hurt, and as she cuddled down in her mother's arms she sighed, "'Nice mother! I don't mind being hurt when you were here to fix me up.' "'Tell me what happened, dear,' said her mother as she stroked the fair hair. "'We were playing,' Jean said. The boys had sticks, and we heard a queer rustle in the bushes. Sandy said it was a snake, and beat the bushes to drive him out. It ran out just in front of Fergus, and I thought it would bite him. And I didn't want anything to happen to my brother, so I ran up behind him just as he swung his stick over his shoulder to hit the snake. He hit me in the mouth, but of course he didn't mean to, mother. I screamed because it hurt me so. And then I tried not to cry because I knew it would worry you. It doesn't hurt so badly now, mother. I'm sorry that it hurts at all, darling. Her mother held her close. You were a good child and brave not to cry. Crawl up in the hammock now and take a nap, and you will feel better when you wake up. I hope Fergus and Sandy won't do anything very interesting while I'm asleep. The little girl murmured drowsily as she dropped off to sleep. Fergus and Sandy undoubtedly would. They were very kind to Jean, but there was no doubt that they found the little girl a clog upon their movements. Fergus was used to taking care of her, but Sandy had no sisters, and he sometimes wished the little cousin would not tag quite so much. "'You can't really do anything much when a girl is tagging around,' he said to his mother, but that long-suffering woman proved strangely unsympathetic. "'I think I shall keep Jean always if her being here keeps you out of mischief,' she said with a smile, and Sandy answered, "'Well, keep Fergus too, then.' No sooner was Jean asleep than the boys decided the time had come for them to carry out a plan long since formed, but laid aside for a convenient season. At one side of the run was a little lake, formed where one of the boundary streams was dammed. A windmill carried water from this to a platform, and upon this were iron tanks from which pipes carried water through the house. The boys had decided to climb to the top of the reservoir and slide down the pipes, which seemed to them would be an exciting performance. The climbing up was not difficult, and Sandy took the first slide. "'It's great fun!' he shouted. Let me have another, as he clambered up again. It's my turn, cried Fergus, astride of the pipe. Let me, you wait, said Sandy, who was used to playing alone and not to having anyone dispute with him. I tell you, it's my turn. Fergus's temper rose. You don't play fair. There was a scramble and a cry. Both boys lost their balance and fell, and the sound of breaking glass crashed through the air. Both mothers rushed to the scene to find two pairs of arms and legs waving wildly from the hotbed, while broken glass was scattered hither and yon. "'You dreadful boys! You have fallen right into the flower-beds and broken the glass! Are you badly hurt?' cried Mrs. MacDonald, as each mother dragged out a son. Very crestfallen were the boys as they stood up, their faces covered with scratches, and Sandy's hand badly cut. "'Sliding down the water-pipe?' said Sandy. "'Quarrelling?' said Fergus. "'Nice way to spend the morning,' said Mr. MacDonald, who appeared at that moment from the stables. "'Go and get washed up, and we'll see if you have any broken glass in your cuts.' When the damages were repaired, neither boy was found to be much hurt. But Jean begged so hard that they should not be punished, that the two were let off for that time. "'The next piece of mischief you get into, you'll be sent to bed for a day to rest up and think it over,' said Sandy's father. And the boys assured him that they would never, never do anything again as long as they lived. End of chapter 4